our weekly Gecko session. Uh, Gecko or Gastro Echo is hosted by the Gastro Foundation locally in association with Project Echo from the University of New Mexico. Um, if you don't know yet, these sessions are held every Wednesday at half past four South African time. And um, this week we uh, will be talking about pediatrics. That's a pediatric turn. As always, the chat will be open for questions and we like as much interaction as, as possible. And um, yeah, let's get going. So this week we've got a bright young star pediatrician who's uh, joined Rahima Musa Hospital, who's going to present a case that we recently had. So I'd like to introduce Kath Carr. Um, yeah, take it away, Kath. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. I feel a little bit out of my depth. But yeah, so I'm a general pediatrician. Let me get my screen sharing. And let me know if you can see my screen. That's um, perfect, yeah. Just move that out the way. Okay. Okay, cool. So yeah, so I'm a general pediatrician. My name's Kathy. Um, I'm working at Rehima Musa Mother and Children Hospital currently. And this is a patient that we saw in our ward recently that Tim and the GIT team helped us with. So the title of the topic is Gold's Ugly Cousin. Um, we'll make a little bit more sense shortly. So this is our wonderful hospital where we work, um, Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital it's in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's a really very, very special place that holds a very special part in my heart. Um, I have no declarations to declare, and I'm not affiliated to anyone barring University of Advantage, Front and Rahima Musa. So we're going to be talking about the little girl, um, KP. She's a nine-year-old female, HIV unexposed, and HIV rapid negative on admission. Her immunizations were up to date. She was developmentally appropriate, and she was referred from CC Co Academic Hospital on the 20th of April this year with a three-month history of worsening confusion, abdominal distension, tala, and jaundice. She was previously admitted in Rustenburg, February this year, for a similar issue and then discharged. Unfortunately, you don't have very much information from the Rustenburg admission and was referred to as from Steve Biko. So from my history point of view, no history of any upper GI bleeds or lower GI bleeds, no rashes or progressive weakness, no joint involvement, no real relevant travel history or family history to note, and no autoimmune conditions that anyone in the family knew about. There was a history of traditional medication that was recently ingested. This was actually after the jaundice had appeared. Her grandmother and her mother were quite concerned as she had recently had become more and more emotionally labile. She had had mood swings and a declining school performance over the last six months. She is South African and there was no history of consanguinity in the family. She has two other siblings, a 13-year-old and a 17-year-old. So when she presented to us, she had a GTS of 15 out of 15. She was alert, orientated, time, person, and place. She was quite calm and cooperative. She really was, a, like, she is a lovely little girl. She was pale, jaundiced. She wasn't clubbed. There was no edema, no joint involvement or lymphadenopathy, bruising, bleeding, or any rashes. Clinically, she did have a distended abdomen with society that was intense. She had linear scars around her umbilicus, which was scarification from a traditional medication, and she had a liver that was three centimeters palpable below the costal margin. With the societies, it was quite difficult to tell if there was a spleen or not. Vital side, she was tachycardic with a heart rate of 115, F normal normotensive, saturated well in room air with a sugar of 5.4 millimoles per liter. Um, from an anthropometry point of view, she was well grown. She had a BMI of 18.4 and a mid-upper arm circumference of 20.4. So having a look at her results, looking at Steve B. Code to Rahima Musa, and we'll go through these. I've got this slide and a couple of others repeated a few times, but you'll see if we have a look at Steve B. Code particularly, you can see that on the 20th of April, when she initially presented, she had this high white cell count of 19.8. She had a macrocytic anemia with an HB of 7.7 .7 and a thrombocytopenia to know she also had a neutrophil predominance. And when she presented, we were, they assumed that she was in liver failure, was maybe precipitated by an infective cause, 
and was covered by broad spectrum antibiotics. With this anemia, she also had a reticulocytosis with a retics of 13.69%. Having a look at her LFT, we can see that she's got a high total bile with the conjugated fraction predominant. So quite a large gamma globulin fraction or gap. Her total protein being 57, albumin being 15, a relatively low ALP and gamma GT. And ALP and AST weren't really particularly affected but with the hepatomegaly and the palan abdominal distension and so forth. Her iron and PTT were raised and her CRP was 12. Having a look then at other, so when she presented in liver failure, they went into a variety of different investigations for us, which was great. And these are some of the ones that we had. We can see from a thyroid point of view, unremarkable, um, lipograb, unremarkable, HIV negative, in terms of a macrocytic anemia, we can see a normal B12 and folate level, but she had a Coombs negative hemolytic anemia. We've got a very high IgG, IgA, and IgM, but IgG particularly, a raised ferritin. We have a negative ANA, alpha antitrypsis the normal, ASP normal. And then we did a tox screen, hepatitis studies, and other common viral pathogens, which were all unremarkable. And she had a low seroluplasmin of 0.1. So from our initial assessment when she arrived and looking at her CC co-history and course, we assessed her as having acute on chronic liver disease and acute liver failure. Our top differentials at this call, case was a Wilson's disease based on the personality changes, the low seroluplasmin, and normal ALP, but no urine copper level as of yet. And we thought perhaps maybe an autoimmune hepatitis in view of her age and her presentation, especially with that high gamma globulin fraction with a high IgG. There was a history of herbal medicine ingestion and potentially maybe a venoclusive disease set up that was much less likely, especially after the herbal meds was ingested only after she became symptomatic. So from an initial management point of view at Rahima, we started her on a high dose zinc, thinking, you know, maybe this is Wilson's disease. We also started her on high dose spread, thinking, you know, kind of this is autoimmune hepatitis, where are we going? She looked okay, but we need to get to the bottom of it. We gave her a bit of KIVI to see if we might be able to correct this um, deranged iron RPTT. We covered her with diuretics, we gave her phosphate and magnesium replacement, and we gave her a PPI to cover with a high dose steroid. Continued this workup, looked up the other outstanding blood results, chatted to the dietetics team to help us from a nutritional rehab point of view and optimization. We consulted cardiology to help us for an echo. We consulted ophthalmology, looking for Kaiser-Flasher rings, and we did an abdominal phone off. So having a look, we saw on her echo that she had left ventricular hypertrophy, very mild subaortic stenosis, which kind of gave you a bit of a hokum-like picture, but otherwise clinically insignificant. She had no Kaiser-Flasher rings noted, and on abdominal phone off, we showed a, we, they showed diffuse societies, no lymphadenopathy, no hepatomegaly, the liver bow was atrogenous in texture, had a nodular capsule, no masses, no dilation, and the spleen was normal. But we did see reduced port spleen as flow in keeping with cirrhosis. So if we go back to all of our results, the blue is when she was at Stibico and then she came to us on the 24th. Um, you can see how that anemia kind of persisted, that macrocytic anemia. So platelets definitely improved, but this gamma globulin fraction was still very rare. So despite steroids with this high gamma globulin fraction, really quite an inadequate response. We thought, okay, you know, probably more towards the Wilson side of things. Also, you can see her ALP also went up, and that's also with zinc. So, I mean, was that ALP secondary to zinc deficiency? Is it also to with the Wilsons? As you can kind of see where we were thinking. You can also see that her phosphate initially borderline low dropped and then started coming back up. But that drop between the 24th and the 27th was also reassuring, hoping that her liver was kind of kicking in and continuing, starting to regenerate. Her iron and PTT didn't really budge, to be very honest. Um, it actually increased a little bit to 3.74, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But really, we didn't have much of a remarkable response to the steroids. So we continued searching further. One thing I didn't tell you about, which we got a little bit later after all of this, that we had a 24-hour urine copper, copper that was now raised. So, a bit of a 
cheesy person on the side and I like to find little comics, so I found this little one. And uh, essentially what we're talking about today is we're going to be talking about Wilson's disease. Okay, so Wilson's disease is a genetic disorder of copper metabolism. It's due to impaired function of the intracellular copper transporter, so particularly the ATP7B. It's coded on chromosome 13. It's autosomal recessive. You have a prevalence of 1 in 30,000. And the crux of it is that you, it results in impaired biliary copper excretion. And that essentially accumulates in your, kind of your bigger, well, the main three organs that we're going to talk about. It has lots of other side effects too, but essentially liver, brain, and cornea. So I like to kind of go back into the pathophys and try and make sure I understand all of it. So just going to a bit of the pathophysiology and we'll go through this quite quickly. But essentially with your copper intake, two to five milligrams per day, gets into the stomach and then it gets absorbed. What happens in a normal situation is that both copper ions should then bind to seroleuplasmin, which is your transporter throughout the body. In Wilson's disease, so this is now on the hepatocytes, you have your copper transport receptor on the sinusoid and copper comes through into the hepatocyte. In the Golgi body, what happens is that that ATP7B is defective. So in the normal situation where copper would then come through, it would attach to seroleuplasmin. Seroleuplasmin precursor is actually called aposteroleuplasmin and is a very short half-life. So what happens is that these six free copper ions don't attach to the ser or the aposteroleuplasmin producing seroleuplasmin and it actually becomes free and it just circulates around the body as a free copper. And it's this free copper that does all the damage and it causes all the drama, essentially. What also happens is that there's impaired excretion into the bile ducts and through the biliary tree as well. Apologies, just fixing this. I don't know if I'm doing anything with the camera, but um, what happens is that it, you get this decreased biliary copper elimination. You get this low copper seroleuplasmin incorporation, and you have this free copper that kind of runs around the body to wreak havoc. So it presents mainly with, and we'll go through this a little bit more in detail, hopefully, well, we will into your kind of chronic hepatitis, hepatic manifestations, your Crohn's negative hemolytic anemia. It affects your cornea, causing Kaiser-Flasier rings, and also neurological disorders. Okay, and essentially this is where we're going. So clinical manifestations are predominantly hepatic. Depending on the age of onset, majority of the time, kids are, it's a very wide range, but the mean is around about 13 years. So um, late childhood, early adolescence, all the way through to much older. The young you are generally the present with more of a manifestation first. So children between 9 and 13, they generally present with a chronic active hepatitis. And there's a very wide variety of how they can present. Adolescents will present a bit later, obviously, between 15 and 21. And they present with majority neurologic symptoms. And that's essentially copper being deposited in the brain. So, this slide you'll see gets repeated a lot and we build onto it, but talking about the kind of um, liver and hepatic manifestations is a very broad spectrum that they can present. They can present anywhere from asymptomatic biochemical abnormality, so kind of the girl with a HEPA and these, you know, um, with range LFT, all the way to steatosis, acute liver failure, acute hepatitis, and a chronic kind of dwelling hepatitis with cirrhosis. From a neurological manifestation point of view, it's very, very broad, and the diagnosis is pretty challenging. But And they can also be very, very subtle or incredibly progressive. So it, it is tough. Wilson's definitely isn't a disease that's um, the easiest to kind of pick up. But they get mild cognitive impairment, especially in kids. So Wilson's isn't very well studied in kids. They get this mild cognitive impairment. They get mood behaviors, and they have declining school performance. And you can have a look and you'll see in coordination of their handwriting and they basically deteriorate. Other things that happen, you get dysarthia, you get gait abnormalities, ataxia, dystonia, tremor, Parkinsonism, Parkinsonism, and drooling. Some of the ocular and hematological manifestations. So from an ocular point of view, if you have a look in the middle picture, that's called a sunflower cataract. And that's one of the ocular manifestations. It's quite cool. Um, you, not for the patient, but you can see how copper actually gets deposited in the lens itself. And then you see the Kaiser-Flasier rings, which are kind of characteristic. This is when copper is being deposited to the descent membrane, 
and generally you need to see the sort of slip lamp, um, you should appreciate the slip lamp, slip lamp examination. 98% of anyone that has neurological manifestations, only 50 of them, I'm oh, sorry, ignore that, but only 50 of them basically have, so if you have neurological manifestations, you don't necessarily have to have a pathic manifestation, but only 50% of them will have it. If you have a look at the blood smear on the top left corner, you can see that there are a whole lot of irregularly contracted cells. You can see all the oxidative stress that's been happening as a result of that copper deposition. So just to know about other um, systems that can be affected as well, from a renal point of view, you can get a renal tubular acidosis, nephrocalcinosis, cardiac, you can get a cardiomyopathy, you can get some, some clinical dysfunction, and arrhythmia, you can get a hyperparathyroidism, pancreatitis, you may even get some skeletal changes with an osteopenia, osteoporosis, rickettsial arthropathy. Okay, so we're going to go back to the slides, we use it a lot. So from a diagnosis point of view, we see it's hepatic, hepatic, re, um, ocular, and neurological, right? And now we need to figure out how we're going to diagnose this. So we're going to look at a seroluplasmin level. So seroluplasmin, you're only going to start doing after the age of one year. And even then, it's not, it's not always great, because even especially in the more asymptomatic kids. So you can actually see a normal value into the third of Wilson's disease. And we'll go into the diagnosis, obviously, now through the talk in more detail. But when you're looking at seroluplasmin, normal is essentially 20 and above. Anything less than 15 has got a 93% sensitivity and 100% specificity that it's Wilson's disease. But if it's less than five, you can pretty put in your money that it's probably Wilson's disease. Another test we can do is your total serum copper. Remember, this is also actually not a great one to use because it's a combination of bound and free copper. So it will be decreased in proportion, and that's in proportion to your Um, We actually use that more for monitoring in terms of response to pharmacotherapy. Um, another thing is with the total serum copper is that a lot of the time it can also be falsely elevated with so what happens with like severe liver injury and it causes all that liver, all that copper to kind of be released from the damaged liver cells. And as a result, you can have a falsely raised total serum copper. So monitoring for response to pharmacotherapy, that's where we're going with total serum copper. Another test that we can do is a urine, urine copper excretion. So essentially in your asymptomatic children or your mild liver disease, you might even get a normal copper excretion. But the idea is, is that you want to have a urine copper for more, of more than 40 milligrams in 24 hours. And that's giving you a 78.9% sensitivity and an 87.9% specificity. Another test that you can do is penicillamine challenge, challenge test. We don't actually recommend it. Well, it's again on the guidelines say that they don't recommend it because you can get a lot of high false positive results. Just to remember, if you are going to do it, it needs to be in a container that doesn't have any acid in it and doesn't have any copper in it. And essentially what you do is that you take a baseline 24 hour urine copper, you give them two doses of penicillamine 12 hours apart, 500 milligram doses, and then you check again. And we'll go into that a little bit later as well, and you'll see how we use the penicillamine challenge test or penicillamine. From a diagnosis point of view, gold standard for Wilson's is essentially trying to find out how much copper is in the liver. So you're looking at dry copper weight. So you would take, when we're doing our liver biopsy, we'll take two cores. So one will be sent to histology, non-specific findings. You cannot use histology to diagnose Wilson, but the other one is then going to be sent for our hepatic copper estimation. So we want a normal copper content of less than 50. Anything more than 250 mics per gram is diagnostic. Remember, this is also um, anyone under the age of one really can't do much for but it can also be falsely elevated in children with chronic cholestasis and then in infancy. There's also genetic studies that we can do for children with suspected Wilson's disease. And this just to note, so this is all on chromosome 13, there are more than 500 mutations. So you're looking for a lot, but it is done and um, you can do it. For children with um, a neurological disease, you can do an MRI and you can see different universal MRI findings for Wilson's disease. The big thing is the double panda. Okay, so we go back to our kind of diagnosis, our setup at this little slide, and we said hepatic, 
neurologic ocular. Anywhere, variety of uh, manifestations in a spectrum and anywhere from asymptomatic to your kind of chronic hepatitis or acute liver failure, neurological and ocular manifestations. So what's really, really handy is that it's again made as this lovely, they've got a lovely article out on Wilson and they give you kind of a step-by-step -step guide on how to do it. You can also use a scoring system called the Ferenki score. So this is from the Ferenki score. You've got three steps. Essentially, you see this kitty, she's got a pack of benomegaly, she's a sitic, she's got these kaiserflasia rings, and we've done some baseline blood. So you can see how from step one, we're looking at your baseline, LFT, INR, ALT, we're doing our copper seroplasmin, our 24-hour copper urine or urine copper excretion. We can go into molecular testing where we're looking for copper mutations and whole gene sequencing, all the way down to getting liver copper where we've got a tissue by um, tissue diagnosis. So this is the Ferenki score and it goes into more of the here and you can see it's a range. So anyway, from minus one to four, you add them all up and anywhere a four or more is highly likely, two to three is probable, and one to zero is zero to one is unlikely. You can see how if you've done a tissue biopsy and the liver copper quantity quantity is normal, it actually gives you a minus one. So you can see how important that copper content on tissue is. You've got your kinds of larger range on your psychiatric symptoms, your hemolytic Coombs negative anemia, high serum copper. And this is a very nice kind of scoring system to give you an idea if we're heading in the right direction. This is another scoring system that I came across. It's called the Lipstick Score. Similar setup, um, same basis as the Ferenki score, just nice to know. But also with the same thing that if it's four or more, you've kind of got a diagnosis established for Wilson's disease. Okay, so we've added a little bit more onto this. So with your asymptomatic children, um, they generally, they very, very rarely present before the age of five years old. They may just have an apatomegaly and this increased here in transaminases. They can also have other kind of um, differentials. So there's like a non-alcoholic <laughs> steatohepatosis is an autoimmune hepatitis. Could it be something else? And um, remember with that autoimmune hepatitis, it's a bit of a um, canary in that what happens is that they ANA positive, but Wilson's disease can also be ANA positive. So it does kind of, is it a little bit challenging? But so this range from anywhere from your asymptomatic biochemical abnormalities all the way through to chronic hepatitis. We've listed the different neurological manifestations, then your con cognitive impairment, working memory and language difficulties, these behaviors. You can have Alkyza Flager rings. And then having a look on the bottom right, the chemical um, abnormalities, so our low seroplasmin, our high urocopin, copper. You can look at your ASP to ALT ratio being more than two. They generally have a thrombocytopenia. They may have a normal or low ALT. You can do a ratio of an ALT to total bilirubin, which will be less than one. They have a coagulopathy, a Coombs negative hemolytic anemia with or without renal dysfunction. And then not to forget our liver copper concentrations of more than 250 mics per gram of dry weight. So now we need to treat these little pumpkins. So from a treatment point of view, essentially the aim is we want to remove all this copper excess, right? The copper's there. Can't do anything about it. We want to prevent it kind of reaccumulating and doing any more damage. So we remove whatever we can. We have two different methods or modes that we can do it. We can use chelating agents such as your D-penicillamine or tretine, and then or you can actually um, block the intestinal absorption using zinc salts. Um, in this stage where it's kind of acute phase, you want to restrict copper restriction. You want to restrict dietary copper. So this doesn't necessarily prevent accumulation, it's just kind of getting on top of things initially. So your copper-rich foods are those such as shellfish, nuts, chocolate, mushrooms, and different organ meats. And obviously, with being a genetic condition, treatment is then lifelong. So initially, we're going to drop down those copper levels to sub-therapeutic thresholds. Um, you can use a combination of chelators and zinc uh, together or alone. And um, D-penicillamine is the drug of choice. But remember, with every drug comes different side effects. So you need to look for intolerance. And if there is intolerance, you're going to go to Trentine. You must, don't forget, you need to give pyridoxine supplementation with the deep penicillamine as well. Once you've kind of got those copper lips down to a sub-therapeutic, sub-toxic threshold, 
we need to get on top of their maintenance. And this is now to prevent that reaccumulation. And in this case, we use zinc. So that's now blocking a test absorption. In the situation where they may or not, um, they may not particularly tolerate it so well, you can still use a penicillamine and you can use it in low doses, but you must just monitor very closely for side effects. So from on that point, talking about monitoring, we're going to look now, and as we were talking about 24-hour urinary copper earlier, we're going to see, okay, well, you know, are we meeting our goals? So zinc, we are affecting the absorption into the gut, essentially. So we're not expecting our urinary copper to skyrocket like it would with, for example, the penicillamine. So we want to try aim for our 24-hour urine copper to be less than 75. With our penicillamine, because we causing excretion, we try to push for excretion, we want it to be high, so about 200 to 500. And then our serum-free copper, we want to be less than 20. So aim for 15 to 15. They're going to need annual slip lamp examinations. Like, you know, we're going to monitor their cell counts, and we're going to watch for any adverse effects of the different medications. For your asymptomatic patients, we're going to use zinc and try to explain to get them to a symptomatic point. So this is a really nice table talking about all three of our kind of choices. Um, Wilson's isn't very well studied in kids. I really like this table because it gave us the kind of milligrams per kilo, anywhere from and just how to administer it, how we, you know, kind of our goals from adequacy on treatment, and then indications for a drug change, which is very important. You can see with the D-penicillamine, different side effects that we look for in our little girl and with all of our patients, is we'll look for things like hypersensitivity reactions, fever, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, lymphadenopathy, or proteinuria. And it's quite encouraging. You can see, like, you actually get quite a quick liver function improvement from like two to six months. It's really reassuring. It's quite cool. Okay, so chatting about the liver transplant, just to touch with this. So indications for liver transplant in these wilsons is actually quite rare. And, but if they do need it, and they are obviously offered the transplant, they have a really good post-liver transplant outcome. The survival rate between 87 to 90%. And neurologically, they're not going to show much improvement really, but hopefully not, well, no worse than any, once we've removed the sort of problem, but um, that's where we kind of use something so neurologically not going to see much. What we do have to help us kind of prognosticate and see where we're going from a liver transplant, just kind of severity of illness when they do go backwards, is using a King's Wilson index. And this is a much better positive predictive value for mortality with our transplantation in kids. So we use it a lot and you kind of use it and monitor it for the kind of prognostic assessment and making sure we don't delay liver transplant. And um, before I go into the liver, going back into King Williams, there's some other really cool trials that they're busy having a look at as well. So there are these corrective adenoviral vector um, vectors that they're trying to use now containing ATP7B DNA, which is very exciting. So that's also something to kind of watch the space for. So going back to the King Wilson or New Wilson Index, we prognosticate these little pumpkins with their Wilson's disease. And you can see kind of all the things that you would look at, bilirubin, INR, AST, white cell count, and albumin. And you're going to get a score. You want that score to ideally be less than 11, but more low. But anything more than 11 means urgent listing. Um, I've just added both of these tables in because they're just different units. So depending on where you're based, it's nice to have the different units. Something to also not forget is family screening and genetic counseling. So really, really, really very important. With these kitties, you want to screen any first degree relative and any sibling with a newly diagnosed Wilson's disease. This incorporates physical examination, serum seroliplasmin, LFT, and molecular testing for ATP7B. Newborn screening is not warranted for now. They say you can delay it up to one to two years of age. Okay. Now we're going to go back to our little KP. So on the 2nd of May, we did this. So this is where we were going. You know, um, we weren't getting really on top of the gamma globulin fraction. Her LFT wasn't really responding. She looked fine, but I mean, really nothing that exciting. We were trying to get ready to try potentially do a liver biopsy for her. So um, with the vitamin K, we started giving her product. She wasn't bleeding, but we wanted to do a liver biopsy to try to confirm the Wilson. 
we got penicillin and we managed to start the penicillin and we weaned the steroids down. Unfortunately, on the 4th of May, we noticed that she just really wasn't herself. She had these subclinical fevers, some mild abdominal pain. We did a septic workup for her and started some tablets and medication. She looked okay. She wasn't terrible, but we all kind of had a bad feeling in our belly. But we watched her very closely. So here, this is all of the results that we were looking at earlier, and there's just a couple more arrows. So you can see on the 20th of April, then we went on to the 2nd of May, and that's where we decided, okay, we're going to start the deep penicillamine now. And then unfortunately, on the 4th of May, that's where she started having those kind of subclinical fevers, and she just wasn't looking herself. If you have a look at her LFT, you can see how that gamma globulin fraction really never got much better. But you can start seeing her transaminases are going up and up and up. Her ALP went up, and is that maybe a response to zinc? Um, but you can also see how her phosphate got much better. Then we start, we will actually dropped, which shows that the you know the cells were starting, liver cells were starting to regenerate, and then it bumped up. And on top of that, her with that bump up in her phosphate, if you have a look at her iron or PTT from the second and the fourth, you can see it's starting to slowly get worse. The CRP was 20, although it only went down to 17 on the 7th, there was something definitely cooking and brewing. Um, she also had her white cell count that was going up, her neutrophil count was going up, her platelets were holding or going up, but we really weren't getting on top of her and something was happening. So unfortunately on the 7th, there was a very, very rapid deterioration. She just got, she was in Kevlopathic, she had these mental state changes, she dropped her GCS, she became hyperglycemic, she started having seizures, she was hypertensive. It was quite a delay to get her to ICU, unfortunately, but everyone really pulled finger and tried their best. She was subsequently intubated and taken to ICU. We started an acute liver failure protocol for her and started with neuroprotective measures. Quiet inotropes was started on adrenaline infusion. We were trying to monitor for electrical activity, make sure there weren't any subclinical seizures, but fortunately her brain monitor showed continuous normal voltage bilaterally. At this point, we were discussing with the Donald, Donald Gordon transplant team for urgent system for transplant because her King William score now had gone up to 16. So here now our red arrows that I was talking about earlier. You can see how that white cell count has gone up. Neutrophils have gone up, her RNR and PTT have worsened, her transaminases have worsened, um, her factor five and her CRP and her ammonia levels were all up, which shame. Um, but not all hope was lost. So on the 8th of May, we managed to go and chat in discussion with Donald Gordon. They suggested, well, we need to get a CT brain to make sure she hadn't bled and in view of the seizures and her depressed level of consciousness, which was normal, which was great. We managed to wean and stop the adrenaline. She was on a ketamine infusion for sedation, which we've managed to stop and wean. And well, weaned just down a bit, but was on ketamine for sedation. And we continued with all of our neuroprotective measures while we hopefully were trying to get a bed for DG. And on the 9th of May, she was accepted. So at DG, she was placed on dialysis, remained ventilated, and actually relatively stable while we worked up for a transplant. We had a bit of difficulty finding a donor, but then she found her donor, and by the 13th of May, she was successfully, successfully transplanted in the early hours. She remained quite stable post-op and was extubated to high flow. Later, unfortunately, developed a bowel leak but went for a washout. And at this point, when I did the presentation, she was still currently ventilated in P's ICU. Um, they did send her liver off once they did the transplant. Showed us that you can see the orosine stain showed dramatically increased deposition of copper and this copper-associated protein, um, causing some cirrhotic nodules. And she had this established biliary micronodular cirrhosis consistent with the diagnosis of Wilson's. So nice to get a clenching diagnosis from a tissue biopsy point of view. Unfortunately, after the presentation, um, she did demise, secondary to kind of complications of a liver transplant. Um, and we are very upset about all of that, but that's not what we're talking about now. We are talking about Wilson, but um, just a thanks to the DG team for all their hard work. So back to the same slide that I've used far too many times, but 
now for repetition and making sure we learn. So just to go back to that kind of diagnosis, some from Wilson's disease have a high index of suspicion. They can present really any, anywhere from an asymptomatic biochemical abnormality, just with a HEPA, all the way through to your really sick cirrhotic kids with acute on chronic liver failure or just fulminant acute liver failure. The big clinches, Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, low seroluplasmin, high urocopper, and then we can do all of our ratios, your AST to ALT, ALP to total bilu. They've got a coagulopathy. They have kaiserslager rings. They, you know, they may be cirrhotic, have abdominal thermal findings, neurological manifestations, ocular manifestations, and then our definitive diagnosis being done on liver copper concentrations being more than 250 mics per gram. So that's me. These are some of my references that I used to compile this talk. And this is just a big thank you to Dr. Damaya, Dr. Nak, and Dr. Madal, the Unit 3 Rahima Musa team, and the Vistanal Gordon Medical Center, the Gastroenterology and Transplant Unit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kath. I think that was an excellent presentation. Um, interesting case. And I'm waiting to see if anyone's got any comments. Um, but maybe in the meanwhile, just to say, again, it really was a good example of teamwork, of working in a less than ideal situation with minimal access to laboratory, et cetera. Um, and, and you managed to make the diagnosis and get it to Donald Gordon. So well done. I don't see any comments. Am I missing something? Is everyone? Ah, there we go. Any comments from anyone? Any questions? So we are uh, competing with quite a lot of uh, pediatric talks in South Africa today. So thank you for to everyone for joining us. And uh, yeah, people complimenting you on a great talk. Well done, Kath. Um, I think unless there's any burning questions, I'm going to close. And just to say a very big thank you. Um, to everyone, thanks to ICO New Mexico and the ICO India team. Um, the recordings will be available on the Gastro Foundation website. Thank you also to the Gastro Foundation and, of course, to Kath. And uh, next week, it will be hepatocellular carcinoma's turn again. Thank you. And, oh, hang on. There's a question. There's a question. I <laughs> know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, so the question is, um, how do you differentiate clinically from Menke's disease? I think Menke's disease is quite a different um, disorder, obviously also of copper metabolism, but we see it in much younger children um, with a whole host of, of different manifestations like the hair changes and, and everything else. Um, clinically, I think Wilson's, we don't really include as a differential for jaundice and neurological things until after five years of age. Um, sure, they can have a bit of a deranged liver enzymes before, but um, that doesn't tend to, to cause overt liver disease before five years of age. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Enoch. You know? Yeah, I think so. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.